There we go. <laughs> all right. Well, it's good to be with you all again. And I have the privilege of, of covering Jesus' statement that he said, I am the resurrection and the life. And we wouldn't be here tonight if he wasn't. Amen. I mean, it, it all rests on that claim. And, uh, and he left us with many infallible proofs uh, that he was alive. And that's also proof that his payment was received that the wrath of God is propitiated, that it's appeased, and that our sins are forgiven. So I am thankful for that. Um, but similar to the Light of the World study we did a few weeks ago, you're going to see that this has the same kind of backdrop, the perfect back backdrop for Jesus to prove his claim. So go ahead and turn your Bibles to John chapter 11. John chapter 11. And, you know, everything is leading to the imagery of Jesus displaying his power to reveal his claim. Just like when he healed the man born blind, um, he, he stated that he was the light of the world, and then he gave a man who had never seen sight. Um, and in this case, of course, with Lazarus' death, Jesus' claim, and then he proves his power. Um, and the bystanders make the connection. So if you look at John 11, look at verse 37. And some of them said, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also kept this, man, kept this man from dying? See, they made the connection. Well, this is the guy that had the power to do this. Why didn't he come and heal his friend? But of course, why was the man born blind? Was it because of some sin that he committed or was going to commit in the future? No, it was for the glory of God. And why did Jesus not go to Lazarus' house until four days had passed for the glory of God? Of God to reveal the power of his claim. Um, so let's uh, have a word of prayer and then we'll get started. Gracious Heavenly Father, your joy is our strength. I just pray that you're pleased with this service, that Father, our lives will be a, a, a reflection of the love that you have showered upon us and the light that you have placed within us by your Spirit. And I just pray that, that we will be encouraged as we think about what Jesus accomplished for us through the resurrection, the hope that we have now to face death with no fear of second death. But Father, just the joy of the Lord being our strength, going forward in his might and completely at peace because we know that you accepted his sacrifice. We're just thankful we have the time and the opportunity to open your word together. We pray it strengthens us and helps us. In Jesus' name, amen. So very similar to the encounter with the man born blind, we see a very similar case with after Lazarus' resurrection, and that is, how did they treat the parents of the man born blind? They wanted to kick them out of the synagogue, right? Well, we see that kind of same reaction after people see what Jesus did with Lazarus, and then they believed. So if you look over, actually jump over to uh, John chapter 12 and verse 42. And this is, a, I really like this statement because it highlights the fact that even rollers that were, were present, you know, those who are supposed to all be on the same page that we're going to go get Jesus and we're going to stop this. It says many of them believed. Nevertheless, even among the rollers, many believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, thus they should be what? Put out of the synagogue, just like the blind man's parents were threatened. You know, this, this, is, this is what's going on in their minds. The leader, Jewish leaders rejecting uh, the proof of Jesus' claim. And what a sad statement. If you go uh, back to 941, we looked at this before when we were talking about the light of the world, but it's worth highlighting again. In John 941, this is really a, 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 to their condemnation. Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no sin, but now you say, we see. Therefore, your sin remains. You know, they couldn't claim ignorance, could they? They couldn't claim ignorance in the rejection of Jesus as their Messiah. And we kind of see this uh, again with the, the, the reality of, of the sad statement there, in addition to the fact that now they don't want anyone to believe in him. They're trying to prevent others from believing. And first they rejected the light. Now they're rejecting the life. And... Uh, 
If you go over to John chapter 12, verse 19, this kind of highlights what they're so angry about. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, you see that you are accomplishing nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. You know? They've been trying to stop this all along. And Jesus just keeps performing miracles. And people just keep seeing him as the Messiah. And they said, see, the whole world's going after him. And they want to stop it. And so the first thing I want to highlight tonight is the plotting of the Pharisees. The plotting of the Pharisees. You know, I will say that I, I like the fact that Jesus performs these miracles and they encourage our faith. And we don't believe in a wishful thinking or a faith without reason. We're not just, you know, drinking the Kool-Aid. Jesus, when he resurrected, spent 40 days with his disciples. That's no little window of like, hey, I think I saw someone walking across the parking lot, but that couldn't be because he passed away. It's not like that. He spent so much time with them, day in, day out, eating with them and teaching them and covering some of the lessons he had taught them before. It's, it's, it's kind of, you know, and then 500 people seeing Jesus at once you know, if one person said, you know what I thought I saw the other day, and you're like, nah, that couldn't be. You think so? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. And we'd be like, that's kind of shaky. But 500 people all seeing the same thing? You know, and, and then the fact that if there was a body stolen, some people like to say, well, the body must have been stolen or, or taken. The minute that their life was threatened, they go, well, I guess I got to show you where I placed it. Why would they die for a lie? And, 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 and it goes on and on and on. And that's why Acts 1-3 says, through many infallible proofs, Jesus showed himself alive. You know, it, 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 there, this is not a wishful, you know, I hope so. This is the reality of history. And it changes the trajectory of our destiny. Amen? We pass from death to life. And that encourages me. And, and Jesus keeps performing these miracles, and they're messianic miracles, and, and, and they validate his claim. But I wonder sometimes, like, I, I was thinking today with Dr. Anderson's message, and it really kind of sunk in how when he said, you know, come up with reminders to pray for the harvest. And, and uh, it just weighed on me today after thinking about that because I have this house in my neighborhood. And I have prayed that that house would just get tore down. I really have. It, that house has just been a curse. I mean, it's had so many drug addicts in that house, and, and one after another, and I've had to stop fights in the street. I've been threatened. I've had to stop spousal abuse. I've called the cops more times than you can count. And it just seems like every time someone's out, someone new comes in, and it's the same story. And I think this, this house is a curse on our neighborhood. And... Uh, and, and I mean, I've seen them come and they say, stay back, we're looking, we're, there's a warrant for an arrest and everything else um, at this house. And, and, and so for a long time, the, the landlord cut off the power to the house. He just, he, you know, he just cut the power off because squatters were coming in and staying in it. And so then I had all these squatters next door and you know, you're raising your kids right next door and you're worried about their safety. And I just thought if that house could go, that would be the biggest blessing. And then I hear Dr. Anderson's message this morning, and I think, why have I not been praying that somebody would move in that I could lead to the Lord? Like, maybe that's where the harvest has to take place. You know? But I, I, don't, I don't know if I have the faith for that. <laughs> you know? And that's where I look at this passage, and I'm so encouraged. I'm so encouraged that I think, well, he performed greater miracles than that. So maybe I ought to start praying like Dr. Anderson said. You see, that's the thing about these miracles. Think of how it encouraged his followers. You know, and while the Pharisees are like, we got to stop this, the disciples were probably just energized. And see, look what the Pharisees said. Look at uh, chapter 11 and verse 51. Um, here it says, well, let's actually go back to verse 49. This will help. It says, And one of them, Caiaphas, being high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, 
nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and that not the whole nation should perish. Now this is, he did not say of his own authority. So this is kind of a, I really don't think Caiaphas understood his own prophecy. I think that he was just trying to, to come up with a good reason to, to, to justify Jesus' death. But, you know, it says here, he didn't say it of his own authority. So it's like the Holy Spirit gave him this message. And then it says, it says, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation. And somehow, I don't think he understood he prophesied, but God knew that this was in light of prophecy. This was, this was foretold that Jesus would die for the sins of the people. But the high priest, I think, was just trying to justify that there's a risk if they don't kill Jesus, and that is that they'll inflame Rome, and, and Rome will want to attack their nation. Um, so the first thing we see that they say then at verse 53, it says, then from that day on, they plotted to put him to death. It was after Caiaphas made that claim, they plotted from that point forward, we're going we're gonna to make sure that we take his life. He's going to die, and it's going to protect the nation. Now, if you go over to chapter 12, um, uh, look at verses 9 through 11. So they didn't just plot to destroy the evidence, which, of course, is Jesus and his miracles, but they plot to destroy more evidence, because over here, they want to kill Lazarus. It says, Now a great many of the Jews knew that he was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priest, and there's that word again, plotted to put Lazarus to death also. Now they could somewhat justify, you know, Jesus is causing such an uproar that Rome is going to attack us. Rome's going to be mad at us. Or Jesus causing such an uproar, but Jesus is blaspheming. He claims to be the Son of God. You know, so they're, they're, there's some reasoning in their mind to take Jesus' life. What's their reasoning for killing Lazarus? Him being alive is unnatural. <laughs> yeah, he shouldn't have had the opportunity to come back to life. <laughs> I mean, do you think they would have said that to the widow's son that Elijah raised? You know, we can't let him live. That's unnatural. No, they just don't like the fact that Lazarus is proof of Jesus' power. And so they just want to get rid of the evidence. Let's destroy the evidence. And they started this plotting. And they just don't want people to believe. And that's what uh, is such a shame here. Um, because if you look, go back to verse 47. We didn't read this. But it says, The chief priest and the Pharisees gathered a council and said, What shall we do? For this man works many signs. What do you think they should do? Isn't it obvious by now? They should believe. They should believe. When he works many signs, there's your sign. But then it goes on in verse 4, if we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him. Everyone but you, apparently. They are determined to not believe. And it's such a sad portrayal of the religious leadership of that day. Now, they also use this argument. They claim it is expedient. That's what we read there in verse uh, 50. It says, nor do you consider that it is expedient for us, beneficial to us, that one man should die for the people. Little did, I don't think he really fully understood the significance of that claim. Because it's absolutely expedient. Because without Jesus, we're lost. We, we, we are, are, we're destined for hell. And they were thinking it's for the benefit of the nation. But Jesus' death is for the benefit of the world. You know, they feared Rome, but they should have feared God. They worried, not, they, they, they say they're worrying for the nation and for the people, but they worried more for themselves. I like this quote. Sidney Harris is an American journalist and once quoted this, says, we assuage our conscience by calling something a necessary evil. It begins to look more and more necessary and less and less evil. 
I'll, I'll say that again. It says, we assuage our conscience by calling something a necessary evil. It begins to look more and more necessary and less and less evil. What were they plotting to do to Jesus and Lazarus? Murder them. But it's for the benefit of the people. Little did they know that we desperately needed Jesus to die on the cross. Now let's look at a different perspective. So we looked at the plotting of the Pharisees. Now let's look at the portrait of Jesus. Um, a couple different little snapshots we get uh, in this encounter that Jesus has around the tomb of Lazarus. Um, go over to John chapter 11 and look with me at verse 32. Um, here it says, Then when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And that's true. He had the power to heal Lazarus from dying. But then it says, Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. So first we have a portrait of Jesus weeping. Now there is a, a kind of a, I know Pastor had mentioned this in one of the sermons he did, where, you know, talking about Jewish tradition, they kind of had like mourners who would follow the, 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 on a death procession, and they would wail and, and make loud noise. And, uh, but this is different. This is more of a, a quiet reflection of the soul. This is more of a put your head down and, 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 and deeply you know, sigh. This is that kind of a weeping. And Jesus knew that he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. Like he knew that's why he delayed his arrival. So I don't believe that Jesus is weeping for Lazarus. Uh, you know, now the Bible tells us he's a high priest. Jesus is our high priest and he's touched with the feeling of our infirmities. And, and so he understands our sadness. He grieves with us. When we grieve, he grieves. He knows how, how that feels. He knows how disappointed Mary and Martha were that he did not prevent their brother's death. But I think on a deeper level, it brings him sorrow to see the cost of sin. That, that he's looking at, at, at what, what sin creates, the heartache that it creates. And I, I love this little expression. It says, sin will take you further than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. We don't see the cost of sin in its entirety. But Jesus knew exactly what sin was going to cost because he's shortly going to be put on a cross. And I think that weighed on him. We know it did because when he was in the garden, he sweat drops of blood and uh, and he even asked the disciples to watch with him and to pray. I, I think he feels for all of us who experience loss because of sin. And I, I think, in a way, he can grieve deeper than we can. Because he knows what it was like before sin. We don't. We were born in iniquity. So we've known sin all our lives. Jesus could see the world before sin entered it. Think of that heartache. And then think of those he loved weeping near him. And then it uses that expression, there was groaning. So weeping and we have groaning, uh, where it says he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. And I, I lean this more to being connected to his suffering. Uh, we actually read the same Greek word where he groaned in the garden when he charged a man, he actually healed a man, and he charged him not to tell what he had done because he said his time had not yet come. But just that reflection or that pause that his time is going to come, I think caused a groaning. Um, I think it was linked to the inevitability of the impending cross. And now he knows that his time is at hand. I mean, the whole reason to perform this miracle, this is it. This is the miracle before the miracle. I'm going to raise Lazarus, who's already been dead four days. And, and, and of course, I mean, it says many believed when they saw his power. But then shortly thereafter, he's going to come out of the grave. But this is all leading to the fact that his time is at hand. And we actually see that a little bit in chapter 12 um, when he's talking about the grain of wheat falling 
uh, over in verses 24 and 25. And it's, we're getting close to that time. And I think there's a bit of a groaning in light of that. And once he performs this sign, there's no going back. There's no going back into obscurity. There's no going back to wedding feasts in Canaan. I mean, to the point that he actually, after he performs this miracle, he, he actually goes to Ephraim, which is 16 miles outside of Jerusalem, to rest. He can't even stay in the vicinity. And that's why it's kind of shocking when he goes into the triumphal entry. I think that the Jews thought, well, he's not going to come and show his face around here. And how significant was it? In fulfillment of prophecy, after they're looking to take his life, he shows up on a colt. And he, they can't take him now because the people are, you know, that's all following Lazarus' resurrection. There's no going back after this. So I think there's a groaning because he knows this is, this is hastening that day that's right around the corner. And, um, you know, and, and so then we have glorifying. So we go from weeping and groaning, but we have glorifying. If you drop down to John 12, verse 23... John 12, verse 23, he says this. But, but Jesus answered them saying, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. You know, and, and then he talks about the seed and, and in reference to who, who loves his life will lose it. And that's a really interesting study. Uh, and the idea that we all know when you plant a seed and it dies in the ground and then that produces the plant or the fruit you know, and, and, and if you think of our, our lives as a seed, you know, think of more about your soul. You know, sometimes we fear first death. And Jesus said, don't fear him who can kill the body, but fear him who can cast both body and soul into hell. That's second death. You know, you know we, we think about the seed. The seed goes in the ground. If, if we know the Lord, we're just going to produce fruit. We're going to come up in resurrection. That's the passage that Adam read this evening when he said Jesus is the first fruit of them that slept. So there's, there is more resurrections to come, amen? And if you know the Lord, you're part of that, you know? You know, your soul uh, will be with the Lord. And so he says, he even talks about here about how the Son of Man should be glorified. Now look at verses 28 through 32. He says, Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. And in personal study, I would actually even spend some time meditating on the fact when Jesus began his earthly ministry at his baptism and he heard the voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Now there's another voice from heaven saying, I will glorify it. Like he has fulfilled his ministry. We're at that point now. Or that, that, he, that he's fulfilled that, that calling. And then, it says, and then it says, therefore the people who stood by heard it and, and that it had thundered. Others said an angel has spoken. But Jesus answered said, this voice did not come because of me, but for your sake. Again, encouraging their faith. He's encouraging their faith. And they're going to need that encouragement because there's some dark days coming. It says, now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of the world will be cast out. So this is how close we are. And we say the time is at hand. And Jesus is saying, now the judgment is that this world has come. That's, that's where we're at. And then he says, and if I am lifted up from the earth, what's he talking about, church? The cross. If I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. There is one way of salvation. And it's through the cross of Christ, which Corinthians says is the power of God to save. And so we see him going from this, this moment of, of reflection and weeping, groaning in his spirit in connection to his suffering, and then glorifying because he's focused on fulfilling his calling uh, to save humanity. Now if, um, look at 12 verse 16. This is kind of an interesting verse. And this kind of helps us to see that even as John's writing this gospel, He's kind of alluding to the fact that they didn't even fully grasp all the things Jesus was saying or all the things that were happening at that moment. And this is where we would say hindsight is 2020. But look at verse 16. It says, His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written about him and that they had done these things to him. And so, of course, you know, this is where they said, Hosanna, and the coming of the Lord, and, you know, this kingdom. And, of course, they wanted him to establish a kingdom. 
So they didn't understand until the church was born, probably, at least in that frame of, of thinking, oh, there's a whole nother plan in place. You know, this, this hindsight that the disciples had. And do you remember how, the, how those who, who, you know, during Jesus' day and during Jesus' ministry in Matthew eleven eighteen, 18, they, they judged John. He said, John said he came neither eating or drinking, and they say he has a demon. For the Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say he's a, he's a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is proved right by her actions. And I imagine the disciples just looked back at the different things Jesus did and were amazed again and again and again. Not just in the timing, but just in the wisdom of the plan of God. You know, they, you know, even whenever, remember how, okay, Jesus keeps performing miracles and he keeps proving his claims and especially the I am claims. <laughs> Do you remember when he cast out the demon and they said, he does this by Beelzebub? And Jesus, I mean, how anybody standing by only had to listen to Jesus say, does a kingdom divide against itself stand? Why would Satan cast out Satan? That is so illogical. There's no wisdom to it. But there is wisdom to his actions. And the disciples now, they, as John's writing the gospel, says, we didn't understand then, but we do now. It makes sense now. They see the wisdom of God's plan. And we see it. Look at Romans. I'm going to actually pull this verse up. I think it might be up there. Romans 5.10. It says, For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son... Much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life. If his death brought reconciliation, his life brings resurrection. You know, his death makes us have peace with God. His life guarantees we'll spend eternity with God. You know, and it's so encouraging. And it's, it's such a clear plan of God since the beginning of the foundation of the world. But let's look at another sad verse, because we keep talking about the Pharisees. And I, I just, we're looking at the heart of Jesus verse, the plotting of the Pharisees. And I want you to look at a verse in Matthew chapter 23. And you guys, if I said the verse, you would immediately re recognize it, most likely. But over in Matthew 23, verse 37. This is, this is, again, this is just a, a contrast. Here's Jesus weeping and groaning. He's weeping. He sees the cause of sin on the world and on us. And then he, he groans because he knows his time is at hand. And he's committed to bringing glory to God. But then he's dealing with these ornery, you know, rebellious and stiff-necked Pharisees. Look what he has to say. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. Just, I, I feel like there should be a Selah, a, a, a Selah after that statement. Just stop and think about that. Who's sending them? God. Not once, not twice. He sends them again and again and again because that's his heart. He wants them to know him. And Jesus says, how often I wanted to gather your children. And I just think of how, you know, faith can be generational. And I know my mom's faith led to my faith. And how, you know, where are, the, where, where are these of faith? Leading others in the right way. Because he says, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But you were not willing. That's, that's heartbreaking. That's what Jesus is dealing with when he's weeping. You know, he's about to raise Lazarus from the dead after four days of corruption. It's not like you could say, you know, somebody said he was dead, but I didn't really see it for myself. You know, I, I, from all I know, he went into the hospital. He could have come out the next day. No, he's been sitting in a tomb for days. <laughs> you know, when he says Lazarus come forth, Lazarus has to remove the grave clothes. I mean... 
What does it take for you to believe? It's kind of like that song. It's a lot of the reason that people won't come to Jesus because they don't want God on the throne of their heart. But I just think of the heart of Jesus saying, how often I wanted this and you were not willing. So lastly, we're going to look real quickly, and this is, this is to encourage all of us at those who are willing. We're going to look at Mary and Martha and Lazarus. Right there at the beginning of John chapter 12, we're going to see the power of devotion. The power of devotion. And how encouraged this must, encouraging this must have been for Jesus. And I, I know we didn't spend a lot of time with Martha. We talked a little bit about Mary, but not enough time with Martha. Martha amazes me in, in this passage of John 11. And I hope her words are an encouragement to you. But uh, we need to be reminded, of, uh, you know, while we're thinking of those who reject the Savior, what about those who've received him? What a joy. And, uh, and we see this here. And look at uh, John chapter 11, verse 21. And I think, what faith? What faith of Martha? Um, it says, now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. So both Mary and Martha made the same statement to Jesus when they approached him. But then verse 22, but even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. That statement, even now, wow, that's incredible. That's an incredible faith. She's already grieving. Her brother has already died. Jesus wasn't here in time. But she goes, I, I know that if you ask it, God will do it. Like even now. And then look at verse 27. Um, in verse 27, she said, Jesus, of course, said, here's the statement, verse 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. Remember, first death, it's just the planting the seed in the soil. It's the second death that we're thankful that we are redeemed from. Um, and then it says, and whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And that's why I wish the Pharisees, they said, everybody's going to believe in him. Not you, <laughs> apparently. But, but look at Martha's response. She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who has come into the world. When Peter made that same claim, Jesus said to Peter, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but the Holy Spirit. And here we have Martha having the same claim and having that same strong faith and then look at Mary. Um, of course, we know Mary fell at his feet, right? Here in verse 31, they were, Mary rose up quickly, went out, and followed her, saying, She is going to the tomb to weep there. But then when Mary came where Jesus was, what did she do? She fell down at his feet. Earlier when they had a meal at Bethany, where was Mary? At Jesus' feet. Now go over to chapter 12. And they made him a supper, and Martha served. And this again... What was Martha doing at the last dinner? Serving. I feel like that was her love language. Martha was just, she, her, she, she shared her love uh, with, with being hospitable. And uh, I, I, I've been blessed by many hospitable hosts over the years. And I think it is an act of love. And I think it's so generous and gracious. And she's, she's making supper. And she's serving. And Lazarus, of course, was at the table with Jesus. Um, and then it says in verse 3, Mary took a pound a very costly oil spikenard anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. I mean, these two, think of their devotion. You know, here she is again, where is she always at his feet? Now she's, she's using this expensive perfume on his feet. And of course, the disciples have an argument because a little bit goes a long way. That's their attitude. And she wants to just give it all to Jesus. That's her heart. I just want him to have it all. You know, and that's where I try to say at the beginning, you know, I was thinking about this today a lot. The joy of the Lord is my strength. I want his joy in my life, but am I concerned about his joy because of my life? You know, and I think Mary was. I think she was just wanting to please the Lord. 
And she is there, and she's just lathering all this, this, this perfume all over Jesus. And, and here's the incredible thing. And this, again, shows that Jesus' mind is fixed on the crucifixion. He knows his time is at hand. Because then he says in verse 7, Let her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial. My disciples weren't thinking about his burial. But here's Mary. <laughs> you know? And here's Martha. And here's Lazarus. And this faith that this family has. No wonder when Jesus went to Bethany, he always wanted to stay there. What could be more hospital, hospitable than to stay with people who you know love you? And they loved him. They loved him. And it's evident. It's evident in these scriptures. You know, there's a thin veil between life and death. It's so thin. We, we don't realize it, but God can see it. Of course, he's, from, from the other point of view, from his point of view, it's very clear. But this is why even Jesus, when talking to his disciples about Lazarus' death, used the metaphor that he slept. And then the disciples just couldn't get it. And Jesus said, well, he, he died. But he used the word sleep on purpose. So when Paul's talking about a believer's death in the New Testament, he also uses the same expression that Jesus did, sleep. Because it's, 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 it's not a passing away, it's just a passing on to the next step of what God has for us. And I think for those who are grieving and they're thinking of Lazarus dying and, and this, this grief that you know, we, we think of what we're missing because they're not with us here. But if we could just get the smallest glimpse of what they're doing there, that grief would be gone. That's why I don't think when Jesus wept, it was about Lazarus in the tomb. He knew, knew exactly what was going to be Lazarus' future. But man, we need to understand that and get that picture. Because sometimes we have this hope that it has so much substance and we don't share it. And I think about those who said, you know, I didn't just go to see Jesus, I wanted to also see Lazarus. Like, there's so much excitement in the city because of what Jesus has done. And why does that excitement go away? Is he not still the resurrection and the life? You know, this world, you know, with its technology, I, I feel like it's getting kind of scary. It, it, it's just getting scary because, you know, they talk about all these things they're developing, but they don't really have a measure of control. And, and, and sometimes it just feels like they're moving forward as an experiment. <laughs> we just hope that they, they don't make a mistake. But then I rest in the resurrection and the power of God. And I believe that I'm going to experience it. And if somebody makes some giant mistake, whether with a bomb or AI or what else, whatever else is going to happen in this planet, that doesn't change where I'm going. That's not my end. Because as Adam read, he's coming to get me. And it's just in a moment. Jesus said, I am the resurrection of life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Do you believe this? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're thankful that we could look at these scriptures tonight and just be reminded again of your power and be reminded again of your promises, your faithfulness, and the attitude of your heart for the lost. And we pray we catch a glimpse of that, that we would be concerned about the harvest, that we would not only seek laborers, but become a laborer. And Father, that we just pray that, we, that we'll see the opportunities that are around us, like my neighbors, that, that the landlord's house next door, 
I don't know who will come there next. But you do. Help me to have the courage to try to be a witness and a testimony. And Father, I pray that we'll all continue to share testimony of what you've done in our lives through your Son. That these little miracles will make a difference. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.